I told you all a bittersweet story about how I lost my cat and then found him six years later, living happily with a new family, and how I made the painful decision not to take him back. And who cares, right? We live in a world of poverty, war, and genocide. Who has time for some guy crying about a cat? But somehow, that tiny, unimportant story seems to have struck a chord. Nearly 800,000 people have watched it, nearly 5,000 have left comments. On the positive side of those comments, I saw outpourings of empathy and comforting thoughts on the nature of loss, animal or human. Many people just seem to need a space to share their own stories of mourning tiny creatures. We humans are big, sturdy things that outlive all other land mammals, so our oddly endearing urge to adopt other species into our families means we're constantly losing loved ones. But most cultures don't have a proper channel for that grief. For human loss, we have the funeral, the wake, the bereavement leave from work. Everyone understands, everyone consoles. But there is no socially validated equivalent for animal loss. Nowhere to put the grief except maybe a post on social media or a comment on someone else's post. My video about losing my cat became a sort of public space for sharing a pain that has nowhere to go, and I was honored to be its host. But among all that warm sharing, there were doubts and concerns as well. Not everyone agreed with my decision to leave Watson with his new family, and that's understandable. It was a knife-edge choice for me too, and people skimming a brief video don't know all the nuances that went into it. Some people questioned why Julie, the woman who found him, didn't make the effort to find me. And since Julie is not young, a lot of people wondered what will happen to Watson if anything ever happens to her. The first time I visited Watson, I was thinking of it as a goodbye. I wanted to make sure he was happy and healthy in his new home, and I wanted to close the loop. I wanted him to know I still existed and still loved him, to bring a little continuity to his disrupted life as he eases into his final years. It was a healing moment to get closure after all those years, but it was also strange and painful, and I left without any clear plans to come back. Honestly, you changed my mind. So many people in the comments were urging me to keep in touch with Julie for a lot of different reasons, and I realized I didn't have to say goodbye with such finality. We live on opposite sides of the state, but last weekend I finally made the journey over the mountains for a visit. I wanted to see him again, and I wanted to put some doubts to rest mine and yours. Last time, the experience was so strange and intense, I didn't linger very long. This time was more relaxed. Me and Julie sat on the patio and just chatted for a while, sharing stories about Watson while he quietly enjoyed our company. On our first reunion, it was hard to tell what he was thinking when I showed up. No big emotional reaction, more a slow thawing of uncertainty until he remembered me enough to trust me. This time was about the same. There was no desperate urgency, no, you came back for me, drama. He was his old self, friendly but unbothered. Seeing this again confirmed for me what I wondered about in my last video, that cats live in the present, that they have no need to construct narratives about their past to tell them who they are and where they belong. They remember friendly presences, faces, voices, and movements that make them feel safe, and that's enough. He paced around, rubbing on my leg for a while, receiving treats and scratches, and then he settled down next to us and just chilled while we chatted. He wasn't anxious about what would happen next. He wasn't begging me to take him home. He was cat in current situation. I did check his collar, which many of you said looked too tight. It was plenty loose. He's just very fluffy. And yes, he's a little overweight, but don't blame Julie for that. Keeping him trim was always a struggle when I owned him but he's still about the same weight he was back then, which tells me his body has reached its desired chonk level and will probably stay there. To all the comments questioning why Julie kept him instead of trying to find his owner, maybe I didn't emphasize this enough before because it's not something I like to think about, but when Julie found him, he had chafe marks around his body that suggested he'd been tied up with ropes. When he came to her for help, skinny and scarred, she thought she might be saving him from an abusive home. It was a gamble she took for Watson's well-being, and I respect that. In the presence of those doubts, I would always err on the side of protecting the animal. Human ownership doesn't hold much weight with me, especially knowing that there are monsters out there. I've been meeting some of them in the comments on my video, people with a grotesquely inverted reaction to things smaller and weaker than them. Instead of the urge to love and protect, they somehow feel loathing and cruelty. We don't deserve animals. 
And even though I tried my best to keep Watson safe during those chaotic transitional weeks as I lived in my van and wandered the state searching for a home, what happened was a result of my choices, so I have to accept the outcome. I did what I thought was best by leaving him with family while I roamed, and Julie did the same when she adopted him. Every day, we're forced to make choices with incomplete information. Then later, we sit atop our towers of future knowledge where we can see every angle of everything and we kick our past selves for the decisions they made in the narrow tunnel of the present. A cat would never do this. Cats never leave that tunnel. Everything a cat does is the right decision forever, not because they're arrogant little shits, but because they were dropped onto this planet without context or consent, forced to struggle and survive without ever knowing why, and they're doing their damn best. So are we. Before I left Watson, well, his name is Sebastian now, but I can't quite let go of my version of him, so how about we call him Wabastian? Before I left Wabastian, I told Julie that if she ever becomes unable to care for him for any reason, he should come live with me, no one else. I realized this could mean getting him back at the very end of his life and inheriting a mess of expensive medical problems, but it feels right. By then, he'll have been Julie's cat much longer than mine, but if she can't be there for him, there's no way I'll let him leave this life in anyone else's arms. I still remember waking him up from his nap in the playroom at the shelter, a little baby fluff nugget. It was his reaction to that interruption that made me know he was the one. He just looked up at me, a giant creature he'd never seen before, did a big stretch, and started playing. Fully present, moving smoothly through time. Cat in current situation. <laughs> 